Okay, welcome to this week's edition of the Right Brain Warm Up. This week in 1993, Indigenous footballer Nicky Winmar stood up to racist abuse, lifted his jumper and said, I'm black and I'm proud. And it was captured in an iconic photo by Wayne Ludby. So I thought it was a good time to do an interview about the creative process with one of the guys behind the creation of the statue honouring this moment in Aaron Tyler. Aaron, thanks for coming. Yeah. So Aaron is a Melbourne-based advertising creative. He's also the man I work with to help bring the Nicky Winmar statue to life along with Tanya Hosh, who was a previous guest. He's one of the most inspiring creative people I know. So thanks for coming. We're going to have a little bit, a bit of a chat about him and also how uh, it was possible to get the Nicky Winmar statue made. Uh, so first of all, Aaron, uh, first question I've asked everyone on this thing is, what is creativity to you? Oh, thanks for that, Alex. Um, obviously, you had a bit of a think about this before that, and I don't want to get too uh, existential. Uh, but what I sort of uh, nutted it down to was, it's really about, uh, for me anyway, uh, creating something out of nothing, and that something can lead to uh, infinite possibilities. Um, yeah, it's like you're pulling something uh, out of complete darkness um, and pretty much have to write the rules because there is no rules ahead of you um, and it can be anything you sort of want it to be. And then once that's done, other people can engage with it and interpret it and cut it up and change it and do whatever they like um, and make, take it on an, its own different path. Um, so I kind of like those two. Uh, something out of nothing and uh, infinite possibilities. And there's kind of no definitive finishing point for creativity, is there? Which I guess is an exciting thing. You can keep building on other people's ideas and stuff. Yes, exactly. It, uh, it joins a, a conversation that's just uh, continuing constantly, yeah. So, Aaron, you've done quite a few things around, like, Australianism, which I think is really cool. Yes. Nikki Winmar is kind of the peak of that, I guess. Um, yes. Do you want to just maybe talk to people around when you did Australia Cash as well? Because I think that's something that was brilliant. Um, maybe yes. just talk through that and explain the idea and how you came up with that. Um, well, I did Australia Cash in uh, 2015. And basically, just a quick uh, what that is, it's... Um, I basically uh, stumbled upon an insight that um, uh, we didn't, we don't really know who the people on our banknotes are. And uh, these people are positioned as, you know, some great Australians um, that we should all know about. And uh, we've been, you know, using them on our money uh, <laughs> forever. Um, but uh, when you actually ask someone, oh, do you know who's on the $50 note or the $20 note? Um, 99.9% .9 of people can't even name one. Um, and I just thought that was just classically Australian. Like we're very laid back. Um, we don't really hold on to, um, we don't put people on a pedestal um, in some ways that other countries do. Uh, so off the back of that insight, I, I said, well, if we don't know who's on the 20, why can't it be Steve Irwin? Or why can't it be Shane Warne? Um, and so I redesigned the entire uh, set of banknotes uh, with icons that are well known and loved uh, in Australia and um, basically just uploaded it to the internet and um, yeah, it went uh, pretty viral, yeah. And you, uh, then you followed up with Stray Coins and you had Adam Goods was on one of the coins as well. Is that sort of uh, yes, yep. So I think about indigenous culture a bit more as well. Well, I actually put Nikki on the, um, on the $50 note uh, when, when I first did it. And uh, um, it actually, um, that was when I first thought about that being a statue because I Googled um, Nikki Winmar statue thinking it was already a thing. Um, and it wasn't, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like I would have thought this image is like, it's so well known and um, iconic that, you know, it just feels like it should be a statue. So I sort of parked that thought. And then, um, on the, the follow-up project, Stray Sh Shrapnel. Um, I put, Great name. Um, put Adam Goods on the $2 coin. Obviously, it was kind of around the time of uh, all the racism stuff. Um, and it was kind of polarised um, at the time. Uh, and, like, obviously, um, as time's gone on, we've reflected on that period of time as a pretty disgusting uh, period. But at the time, it was still, you know he was a divisive character 
Um, and I just thought, God, it's so weird that some people see it one way and, and other people see it the other. So I included him um, as a bit of a, um, you know, more positive kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and he's, no, go on. Uh, just like he was just standing up for like, something that everyone would stand up for for themselves so yeah well exactly what nikki did and obviously the, the two are kind of entwined now so maybe yeah. we could just talk about the process of because it was in 1993 about about this week in 1993 that nikki stood up to it do you want to talk through the process of how how the statue uh came about um okay so i'll never forget because i was actually in a um I was in a client meeting, I think, and uh, you'd actually ping me a text and uh, we'd, we'd obviously um, uh, bonded um, through just mutual respect and stuff like that. We've kind of liked each other's projects. Um, and you ping oh. me this text and you're like, um, uh, you know, what, what would you think about uh, collaborating on a, a project to do a statue of Nikki Winmar? And like, we'd never talked about mm. like, you know, we'd obviously talked about footy a little bit, but not anything like about indigenous stuff or um, that particular a moment in time or anything. And I like pretty much lost my shit because um, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, um, I, I put some brief notes together about um, this thing becoming a statue um, inspired by the Stray Cash project. And um, I had a, um, just some early initial thoughts like I do with most of my ideas. I'll just do a mind dump to go, oh, could it be this? Could it be that? Um, so I had a few notes on a Nikki Winmar statue and you sent that through and I was just like, oh, I've got to get out of this meeting. So like I got out of the meeting, like <laughs> made up an excuse. And then I just got on the phone to you. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like um, uh, it was just one of those weird moments. Um, it's so funny that the, it's that same sort of thing. Like I so I'd, obviously had the idea a few years earlier as well. And I was the same thing. I just kept going, why isn't there a statue of this thing? And it's just funny. Like, I think it was the right time because we both started to think to ourselves, why isn't there a statue of this incredible yeah. moment, you know? Hmm. And what's funny is um, when we first put it out, the, uh, the idea, you know, we, obviously the next step of the process was uh, getting in contact with Nikki and um, making sure it was cool with him. And he, he liked it obviously. And, um, but then when we actually put the, the thought out there, like uh, in the shape of a possible crowdfunding campaign, um, a lot of people already thought it, it had already existed, right? So it's sort of almost like it's that classic, like if an idea is good, it feels like it, um, it's already been done, mm. if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, sometimes um, the greatest projects are things that everyone goes, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, it seems yeah. so obvious, but it hasn't been done. Yeah, so obviously we um, put together the um, the development for the thought and put a few um, rules in place, like um, you know it's got to be exactly like the ones at the MCG. We don't want to do like a half-assed version or like a small sort of thing. It needs to be on the level of the um, the uh, the ones around the the ground at around the MCG. Um, and then um, we also wanted the same sculptor that had done all most of those, um, you know, which uh, Louis Lerman, who's arguably one of the best in the business. Um, yeah, so what we um, put the possible campaign out there, uh, which ultimately is just us putting out the idea um, and hoping uh, people would would connect with it. Um, what do we need? Like 180,000? 180. 180, like mm -hmm. which is obviously a lot of money, but we kind of thought, well, you know, it's such an iconic image. Um, you know, we'd get heaps of traction on this and people would get behind it, especially because uh, like indigenous issues are um, increasing every year. And, um, you know, so yeah, we put the uh, possible out and, uh, we kind of didn't really get much traction, did we? No, we kind of, we can't, we both sort of thought, and Nikki's manager, oh, we'll just get this money in a few weeks, but it really, we got like 12 grand in a week or two. Yeah. And we were like, and that was What's mostly happening? our mates. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And so and take and us through did... the process of trying to go, all right, well, 
we thought this was going to happen because that's what I think is good about this project for creative yeah. people is it's never giving up because we could have no. given up, but we thought, no, this is a good thing. So what was the next thing? Well, I guess, yeah, it's just having that, uh, you're just like, nah, you just have the belief that it's going to happen. Um, so then you go, all right, well, what's the next option? So like, you know, this, it, even though it's been on like AFL 360 and like NITV had picked it up, like it was definitely getting out there. Uh, we weren't getting the, um, you know, the five, $10 donated that you need to make it a reality. Um, so I guess we started then going, all right, well, let's start reaching out to um, companies and stuff. So we sort of found um, a massive list of companies that had um, indigenous um, plans in place. So we thought, all right, well, um, this is an indigenous um, story. Um, they might be interested. We like emailed what, like oh, a couple of, a hundred, over a hundred? Yeah, heaps of Do them. Dozens of them, uh, yeah. Dozens of them um, and tried to reach out to a few like um, local and state sort of government people as well. We uh, even tried we... Um, celebrity Rich St Kilda supporters as well, didn't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we just thought we just need to get it out there and uh, get it shared and um, get some contributions towards it. Um, and uh, obviously, I, th I think the only person that actually responded to our email was what, the lotto or something. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Lotto, Lotto, Lotto. Lotto. Yeah. But they obviously did, they didn't um, contribute towards it, but they, at least they responded. Hmm. Um, so it was like about halfway through the crowdfunding um, campaign when um, we kind of thought, shit, we need to get like, you know, the AFL involved in this and not so much to pay for it, but to um, just maybe share it out to give it a bit of, um, bit more gravitas, I guess. Uh, so uh, we hit up um, uh, Tan Tanya Hoish, um, who's on the board at the AFL and is responsible for um, like the social stuff and uh, Indigenous issues within the AFL. Um, and sh she'd um, already heard of it. Um, it might be even worth telling people how we reached how you reached out to Tanya because we saw that she had tweeted the campaign out. Oh yes, that's um, right. And yes. then yeah, take us through that. Yeah, so she tweeted it and I'm like, all right, um, I don't know, Tan I didn't know Tanya at the time. Um, so it's like, um, stuff it, I'll just hit her up on LinkedIn and like hope for the best. Um, I'm sh like, you know, people at that sort of level, you know, probably get hit up by people all the time. Um, so it's just one of those things like you're a random person hitting someone up. But, um, you know, if you believe that the idea has got weight, um, yeah, no, I just, uh, just messaged her on LinkedIn and, and pretty much got a response straight away. And, um, within 15 minutes, I was on the phone chatting to her and, uh, probably the most inspiring thing that, uh, she said in that initial chat was, look, um, we don't have a plan for this, obviously. Um, and, and you can imagine like the AFL plan things like way yeah. ahead. They've got a big schedule, like. And we've seen a bit of that in the recent uh, coronavirus times. But um, uh, she said, look, we don't have a plan, but this is something that feels like we need to do. So mm. uh, let's um, figure it out. Um, so from there, obviously, um, what there was, uh, they said, oh, she also said, don't worry too much about the crowdfunding campaign. Like, um, you know, um, this is something that uh, we'd like to get behind and, uh, help make happen, um, especially as a as a community based um, based thing. So yeah, got back on in contact with Nikki and uh, Doug and and sort of said, look, there. Uh, oh, just so everyone at home, Doug uh, was Nikki's manager, Doug Bear. Oh yes, um, and uh, basically said, yep, it's a go. Uh, we just got to figure it out, and like that was um, that was the beginning, really. I think what's good for people listening at home is to go like, I think Aaron has said, we tried dozens of people, dozens of companies, but if you keep going with it, eventually you might find that one person who can make the huge difference. So that's, that's why I think Aaron, it's, it's great to have on because it's that just never giving up. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Cause like I think I've said to, on this podcast, it's easy to have a great idea. Well, it's not easy, but it's the, it's easier than actually making something. And that's why I think Aaron's a great uh, person to have on because he gets up and makes things like, like Australia cash, for example, 
you didn't have a client. You just went, this is cool. I'm going to do it. The same thing with Nikki. Don't have a client, but this is something that needs to be done. So I think that's really important for, for creative people. I think that's quite inspiring. And so maybe fast forward to how the process was to make sure that it was the perfect sculpture. So it wasn't a sculpture which um, people would look at and go, oh, it doesn't really look like Nikki. <laughs> like we need to make yeah, it perfect. Yeah, yeah. Maybe just take through the process of making sure it stayed on point the entire way. Oh, sure. Um, well, this one was interesting because like, obviously I'm, I'm an art director, um, uh, but this one we were kind of like, because uh, we um, engaged uh, Louis Lerman uh, to make the uh, sculpture. So it's like, um, for me, uh, we've engaged one of the best um, uh, sculptures uh, in Australia to make this um, this statue. So for me, I didn't want to really get involved too much. And like, oh, it, for me, it's like, it's absolutely whatever he wants to do. And I was just there to facilitate um, um, his vision for the, for the sculpture. Um, I guess there was some preliminary um, research that um, Louis does for all of his sculptures. Um, some of that is like he found the, uh, a replica of the jumper that um, uh, Nikki was wearing um, at the time. And he, I think he got that from, uh, there's a, there's like a sports memorabilia store. Like it's got all the old, I forget, do you know the name of it? It's down in Collingwood. Um, sure. oh, I forget the name of it. Um, it's a great store. Like I wish I could remember the name because it's, it's definitely fun to walk through. So he, he sources all the original uh, clothing that um, Nikki was wearing. Um, he also uh, got Nikki uh, and did like a full measurements measurement of Nikki. Now, obviously Nikki's um, a lot older uh, since the day, uh, but those, um, those bone structure um, measurements are the same. So he measures up all these, um, you know, skull measurements and uh, arms and all that sort of stuff. Uh, then the next thing that Louis did was um, he found a, a football player that was, do you remember who that was? That was uh, Ben Long, I think. Wasn't it yeah, Michael Long's so. cousin or That's son right. or nep yeah, nephew, yeah, yeah. something like that, who played That's for right. St Kilda. Yes. Mm. That's it, which is a nice marry up as well. Um, but so Louis and uh, his assistant, uh, Liz Johnson, who was assisting on the project as well, um, went down to St Kilda Football Club and, and got um, uh, a player to sort of um, recreate the moment uh, so that he could have a, a, a realistic um, uh, life model to then um, basically uh, what he does, he makes like a, a miniature version of the big two metre statue. Um, and that's almost like a preliminary sketch. Like most artists will do like a quick sketch before they do their sort of uh, final painting. Um, it's basically just to get all the proportions right and figure out um, the composition and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that was the, the preliminary, uh, the first sort of round. Uh, then the next process, he, he takes that small um, sculpture and um, uh, basically makes a, a clay version of that small one um, at scale. So the, the size of a, a Nikki sculpture is a, a size and a half, basically. Uh, so it makes that big... Um, that big clay model. And then basically from that model, they make a mold. Um, so they put fiberglass and um, stuff over the, the top of it, uh, get the mold that's then removed. And that mold is what's used to um, create the, um, the final um, molds to put the bronze into. That's so how long is that process for people at home? Do you think it sounds, Sounds like it's going to take a while. Yeah. Well, um, I, I honestly had no idea. Um, I knew it would like, obviously you'd know that it would take some time, um, like, you know, maybe a couple of months, but, um, I think it was what, was it eight months? Yeah. I think it was months? about 
It's about three three months for Louis to do the actual the dis- clay, yeah, yeah. clay, and then it was another yeah. three months for the bronzing and stuff like that. It's pretty incredible the amount of just the detail and just the perfect. It was interesting seeing it was perfect but imperfect. Like he left some of the shaping tool marks in it just to give it yeah. a bit of soul, which is why we thought Louis is so yeah. amazing because it has a soul to it. It's not just yeah. a photo perfect re- re- reenactment of it. One one thing I, I found kind of interesting and, and Louis sort of said, well, because there's two photos of um, Nikki doing the stand that were published in the two separate uh, newspapers. Um, and he said he decided to, to make it look like um, uh, the sculpture of Nikki was saying something. So the mouth's kind of a bit open. Um, and because... Uh, as the story goes, uh, he lifted up his jumper and said, I'm black and I'm proud. So he added that detail rather than sort of having the mouth closed and having it more of a, uh, like a, a statuesque um, sort of pose with a mouth, with his mouth closed. He's kind of opened it to go and give it a bit of life. Um, so that was just kind of an interesting uh, thing that he's added in. Um, as he tends to do, like he'll take the historical, like he works mostly from historical imagery, um, but he'll add little twists and stuff to um, make it um, sit better, I guess, as a sculpture in space. Um, yeah, because ultimately what he was working from was a flat flat image. So to take that from the 2D world into the 3D world, there's things you've got to do to, to make it work from uh, every every angle. Now, what did it make you feel like when you first saw the actual statue uh, being unveiled at uh, Opta Stadium? So you can all go and see it when this pandemic has finished. So what does that make you feel and how do you feel, feel other people will feel looking at this statue? Um, well, obviously it was pretty pretty incredible. Um, obviously we'd seen um, the statue from every process from the small little model to the uh, the big clay sculpture to the um, unfinished bronze shape um, but then seeing it uh, in place in Perth um, with the black um, veil um, getting taken off it um, was obviously just breathtaking and the fact that you could uh, see the statue and then see the man reacting to the statue was um, for me like uh the the best part about it um you know uh it was a two and a half year project but um you know it was all worth it for that like split moment um you know it was it was incredible so for people at home what do you reckon is a good tip to get to keep the passion up for a project like it's a two and a half year process not making money <laughs> doing yeah. it. It's just something that you yeah. felt like you need to do. Like what's the, what's the, a tip you can give people to, to keep that passion going for something that they, they really want to do? Um, I guess I'm sort of lucky in the sense that as a freelancer, um, I, I'm, na- I'm naturally used to picking up a project and putting it down and uh, it's something new every day. Um, so what that project actually gave me was, um, some consistency um, because I, I'll be, I might do, um, I might be at a place for a month, uh, then another place for a couple of weeks, then maybe two days here and another month. Uh, and it's all different. Uh, what this one was, was a constant uh, project to have going. And obviously, um, it was like a roller coaster in the sense that um, obviously there was no plan for this. And when you throw something, an idea like that into the um, into the, uh, into the ring. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to figure out. And, um, so for me, it was like, uh, it was like, it's kind of like when you play golf, like, you know, um, there's 10 to 15 bad shots and you're just thinking I'm about to quit this. Um, and then you hit that one thing. So something will happen and it'll all start coming together. Um, and you're like, ah, oh, here we go. Like I'm, I'm, I'm stuck into it for another 20 shots. Um, and, uh, I guess, um, if you just believe that, um, it, it can be done, um, you can make it happen. Uh, if you just, you know, go through those 20 shit shots to, <laughs> to that, that good one, you know, I, I love that. It's just believe that's a really, imp- yeah. it's a, such a great word. Cause you just, if you believe in it, 
it will happen. If you give, if you lose belief, it's obviously not going to happen. So I think that's fantastic advice. Yeah. I think like belief is the, you know, if you believe it can happen, um, you know, without getting too like Tony Robbins on it, it's, you know, you can, you can make it happen. And like, it, it might seem like it's just a big concrete wall in front of you and um, you have no uh, pathway because ultimately when you're doing like new ideas, there is no, there's no, you're going into the black. You're basically writing what's in front of you. Mm. Um, so you can kind of use that, you know, the unknownness to your advantage and, and kind of, um, just think of other ideas on the fly to kind of, you know, problem solve your way through it. Um, but yeah, ultimately, yeah, belief would be, yeah, if you believe it should be done, you can make it happen. So just on that uh, unknownness, I think that leads us really nicely into the part of the right brain warm up where we ask a question from the right brain workout, which is right here. So this question um, for Aaron is by Karen Ferry, who's uh, advertising creative and she's also a regular panelist on Gruen. And her question is, which hopefully people listening at home will come up with an answer to is, the year is 1797. You are English botanist, George Shaw. Describe the platypus for the first time in your letter back to Mother England. So I thought that was an appropriate question because we're talking about indigenous yeah. culture and stuff and uh, the history of Australia. So Aaron, what did you come up with as an answer to that? Well, uh, actually, I actually had a look through and I found a, um, an actual letter um, he'd sent to his, not Mother England, but his actual mother. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just read that for you here. <clears throat> uh, dearest mother, you'll be pleased to know that I've finally developed a habit for making my bed every day while in Terra Australis. In fact, I've also learned how to cook. Can you believe it? Please find attached a recipe for, for the duck rat omelette made by eggs of a creature I discovered whilst on a drop bear hunt. It's a rat with the features of a duck and it swims in the river. The dish goes perfectly with a side of frog rat. I'll put some eggs in the mail for you when Terra Australis Post gets its shit together. <laughs> uh, those docs you needed me took two years to arrive. Love, your Georgie boy. <laughs> I love he had such a filthy mouth. <laughs> True, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's all right. Hey, you're just reading out what George Shaw George wrote. George was a scoundrel. <laughs> he was a naughty boy, naughty, naughty boy. That's brilliant. All right, well, we're about to leave. Uh, maybe is there one thing that you reckon you could put out to people in terms of creativity uh, that you would say, I know you used to talk about belief, but maybe in this scenario now, what would you, what would you give as advice to people to keep, to keep going in these, in these tough times? Um, I guess it's kind of hard to find motivation um, when, you know, some, for a lot of people they have no like view of what's next. Um, like personally, like as a freelancer, I live my life in that space all the time. Like, I'll be out of place, but very rarely will I have something lined up. Um, and there's obviously a lot of people that have lost their jobs and all that sort of stuff. Um, and are used to having, you know, a network of people and things around them uh, to go, okay, this is the next thing you're going to do. Like it all, this is the next thing you're going to do. To start from a zero space um, is quite tough and like, you know, uh, pro procrastination and um, uh, it's like, Sometimes you just don't, you just can't even find a, a way to start. Um, so for me, uh, I always like to start really simply um, and just just find something that you're most interested in doing that you can actually see yourself doing for more than 10 minutes. Um, and that's the, that's the, the start. Um, because if you can't get yourself to get 10 minutes worth out of it and you have to force yourself, um, you're probably not going to, be able to do anything good with it so yeah something that can hold my attention for 10 minutes i can usually do it for you know 10 weeks if that makes sense or two and a half years <laughs> or two and a half years <laughs> it is yeah, exactly. i think that's it's a good thing like uh, it's that little thing where if you just start something start something small then you can get somewhere if you start going i'm going to do this big amazing thing you probably won't do it because it's too big but if you yeah. chunk it down to little bits and pieces maybe that's a, a, a better way to do things a hundred percent. And it's okay to have a massive idea and massive, like impossible, uh, big thought, but, uh, the starting point, if you can't find that interest, um, yeah. And you're just doing it to get to that big, uh, end point. You're going to struggle, I think. Yeah. 
Oh, great. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for your time. Cool. Um, thanks for everyone at home having a listen. Um, and this is the right brand warm up. And when in doubt, turn to your right side. Thanks. See ya.